Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in for another edition of Creating Comics with me, Prentice Rollins. This is the first of two lessons in which I will be dealing with the creation of comic book covers. The cover of a comic book is an incredibly crucial part of the success of a comic book. It's the very first thing the viewing and buying public sees, and it has to speak for and advertise the book in a way that's eye-catching and appealing. These are just um, some of the covers that um, I've worked on. Some of them were drawn um, completely by me. Some of them I just inked, um, but I'm fond of all of them very much. Uh, that's hardware that was colored by Jason Scott Jones. Very fun. Oh, this is the cover of Jekyll Island Chronicles Volume 3, came out in 2021. What a pleasure it was to work on that. Unpublished cover for Bang Babies, a milestone comic that was never actually published. Superman, nice montage. Batman, nice montage again. JLA Foreign Bodies, Val Semix was the penciler. Uh, Survival Machine, a collection of sci-fi short stories by me. Flash Iron Heights, penciled by Ethan Van Skyver. Robin, penciled by Pat Gleason. Uh, Green Lantern Corps, also penciled by Pat Gleason. And uh, covered a Wizard Magazine. Ethan Van Skyver did the pencils. I did the inks. Uh, the cover of my graphic novel, The Furnace, from Tor Books. Um, and this is a uh, project that's coming up, uh, The Temple. It's going to be a series, I think, from Scout Comics. Just to start things off on a note of levity, let's take a quick look at some famous or infamous comic book cover fails. There's many, many to choose from, but here's just a few covers that went off the rails in some spectacularly interesting ways. Crimes by Women. This is just strange beyond comparison. You just don't know what to say. Calling All Boys, starring everybody's favorite creep, J. Edgar Hoover. Wow. <laughs> and here's the bouncer, everybody's favorite cross-dressing, I mean, toga-wearing weirdo. Somebody's idea of a superhero in the 50s. Wiz Comics. I don't think things got worse for poor Captain Marvel. I think this was the bottoming out point for him. The world's finest comics just goes to show that even Robin, Superman, and Batman can find themselves in some pretty questionable circumstances. Okay, enough jocularity. I was recently asked to do two comic book covers by my longtime friend and colleague, Carl Paulino. Carl is an accomplished filmmaker, animator, and teacher who's had a lifelong preoccupation with comics. A couple of years ago, he decided to publish a superhero comic of his own and Spontania was born. Spontania, also known as Elkie Eckhart, is a high school gymnast with a superhuman ability to read people's emotions and predict their actions. Here's some of the covers for past issues of Spontania done by other artists. There's Spontania issue number one, issue number two, number three, number four, number five, Mystery Therial, and number six, Battling Some Giant Wolf Creature. If you're interested, you can learn more about Spontania here. One of the covers Carl wanted was for an ordinary issue, and the other was to be the cover of a trade paperback compilation of several issues. In this lesson, I'll be talking about the ordinary issue. Carl wanted for this cover a montage showing Spontania in her superhero garb, two subsidiary characters that feature prominently in the issue, a scary looking robot that's also in the issue, and a house burning down. My job was to assemble these components into a montage image that was unified, exciting, intriguing, and visually appealing. Now, a montage, of course, is an image where a number of scenes or characters from a story are arranged in an appealing composition that makes the viewer want to know more. 
Many famous movies have used montage imagery in the posters that advertise them, such as... Apocalypse Now, starring Marlon Brando, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Wars, the original Star Wars. Comic books also frequently have montage covers, showing a variety of characters and or scenes to create an intriguing sense of what's going on in the comic. Here's a few montage covers that I've worked on in the past. This is the cover of Jekyll Island Chronicles, Volume 3, um, colored by the brilliant Jason Scott Jones and drawn by me. Nice montage. JLA Incarnations, penciled by Val Semix. Uh, montage showing a bunch of the Justice League characters. The cover of the Omnibus Edition of DC One Million, also drawn by Val Semix, also showing a lot of the JLA. This is the cover of The Furnace, my graphic novel, from Tor Books. Montage of the three main characters. I decided to do both covers entirely digitally using my Wacom tablet, using my chosen software, Clip Studio Paint Pro. Clip Studio is an excellent software for making comics art. In fact, it actually used to be called Manga Studio. It's similar to Photoshop in many ways, but has all sorts of bells and whistles that facilitate the creation of comics specifically. Let's just dive right in. So this is the very first rough sketch I did of Spontania. And this is my first pass at a general composition for the cover. As you can see, the uh, composition is pyramidal. It's like a pyramid. And that's always a good composition because it denotes stability and uh, permanence and it's just kind of pleasing to the eye. Okay, now I'm starting to do some final pencils of Spontania and those three figures that have laid in on a separate layer are reference turned around shots that Carl sent me. And I'm working in blue here because when I start actually inking on a separate layer, which I'm opening up right now, um, the blue won't conflict with the black ink. And as you can see on the right, I'm naming that layer Spontanea Inks and I've given a black color um, to remind me that it's black ink. Now I'm lowering the, um, the luminosity of the pencil layer, the blue layer, so I can see it, but it's not quite so distracting. And I'm inking with <clears throat> the real G pen, which is one of the inking tools in Clip Studio. And, um, it, it mimics the, the line, the quality of the line of an actual crow quill pen. And I'm just starting to put in lines. And <clears throat> I must say, after many, many years of inking for DC Comics with real inking tools, um, crow quill pens, brushes, India ink, white ink, um, digital inking like this is, um, by comparison, <laughs> it's pretty easy because if you make a mistake, you can backspace, just click undo, um, and with no fuss or muss. When you put an ink line on an actual piece of Bristol board with a real crow quill pen, you're committed. And if you mess it up, your only option is to um, put white ink over it and do it again. You don't have that problem when you're digitally inking. There's the, uh, the finished inks for Spontanea. And now I added in this rough uh, this is several hours, you know, later that I had completed this rough of the entire cover, um, incorporating the final links of a spontanea, and um, and I sent it to Carl, and he approved it. He was very happy with it. There's the final links of the two subsidiary characters, and there's the final inks of the robot in the background. So now I've, I've completely inked all of my main characters. 
Now uh, I've, I've kind of roughed in the house on fire in the background. And what I'm going to show you now is I'm using the ruler tool, the curve ruler tool. If you look at the left, when you open up the ruler, you got all these options, linear ruler, curve, figure ruler, ruler pen, special ruler. I'm using the curve ruler um, for the background house. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to get some really slick, uh, consistent lines because this is a, there, there's after I've, I've ruled in all the lines I'm going to ink over. And now I'm picking, um, the G pen, making sure my ink is black and I'm adjusting the, uh, size of the pen. And now I can just kind of ink over those ruled lines, quick and easy. This is another advantage of inking digitally. When you're inking with real tools, you've got to have an assortment of real bona fide templates, rulers, a French curve, all kinds of things. And there's the final kind of simple inked in house that's going to be on fire in the background. And all of these elements have their own layers. That's one of the hard things to get used to when you're working digitally is making sure that you keep everything separate in its own layer. Here I'm using the crosshatch tool to create an interesting texture for the roof. And I, I give this crosshatch effect its own layer. And now I'm, I think I'm just using the spatter tool. Yeah, it's the, it's the, um, it's like the airbrush tool and there's a spatter option and you can, you know, kind of jazz up the effect with, with spatter of various kinds. Now I'm using the eraser tool to kind of neaten things up, to get rid of, because I've kept this crosshatch effect in its own layer, I can do this without erasing the ruled lines of the house. Now I'm continuing on freehand without bothering, you know, to, uh, to put in new ruled lines. Um, just, just jazzing up the house, adding more brickwork and effects. And I'm going to do something interesting here. I've added these two kind of shadows and I'm going to, and I've given them their own layer also. But now I'm just going to start scribbling like this with the pen. And if you look on the very left of the screen, you can see that I've selected, there's the two black options and below that there's a clear option. And I'm using that to remove ink. And I'm just creating this kind of freehand crosshatch effect using the pen and the spatter tool just creates visual interest and this is kind of a technique that I've you know developed over many years and I do it when I'm working with paper and traditional tools and digitally and there's the house with the bricks laid in and here I am I'm, I'm uh, kind of starting to ink the flames coming out of the windows because this is supposed to be a house on fire. I don't even know why. I haven't read the issue. I haven't seen the script. All I know is what Carl told me. He wanted Spontania, these three characters, and this burning house in the background arranged in a montage. There's the completed line work for the house. And now, as you can see, as I said, I've kept everything in its own separate layer. So I can kind of turn those layers on and off at will. And now what I'm doing is I am erasing, using the eraser tool, um, the house that's behind Spontania so that um, it doesn't conflict with her. There's the house with a very simple color treatment. 
I've uh, those are the flames. They've got their own separate layer. There's some uh, some rendering that I've started on the flames. Now I'm using the um, I'm selecting um, then the entire flames layer to sort of isolate it. That way I can quickly and easily continue with the, the sort of rendering that I've done. What I'm doing now is I want to create this huge apocalyptic billowing smoke effect or flame effect explosion in the background. It's going to look really spectacular. Why? I don't know. There's no real rationale. It's just when you're doing a cover, you want to make that thing exciting and eye-grabbing and intriguing, as I've said. So here I'm using the uh, airbrush tool. This is all sped up um, to create that sort of apocalyptic flame effect. Looks really nice. Now I'm going to start coloring. So I've turned those layers off and I'm going to start coloring Spontania. And with that image of Spontania that you see there is an image, a reference image that Carl sent me. And I'm using it to pick colors. And I just have to hover my pen over the image and click the little button near the nib and it instantly selects that color. So I've got my color selected and now I'm going to use the G pen and start coloring. And this is one of the more zen, fun things about drawing comics is you feel like a kid again in the sense that you're sort of coloring like in a coloring book. Um, and all you really have to be careful to do is stay inside the lines. It's very relaxing, um, very enjoyable. And as the thing starts to come together, it's very satisfying because you, you start to get this really nice lovely image that you've worked so hard on and it's coming to life. Things really only come to life when they're when during the color process. And again, I'm keeping I'm keeping all of these layers separate. And what I've done now is I've opened up a new layer um, I, th I think it's just called Tones, or Spontanea Tones, and I'm um, adding shadowing using the airbrush tool on all the down planes because I want it to look basically like the light is hitting Spontanea from above. So I have a layer for Spontanea flats meaning just the ba basic flat colors, and a separate layer for her tones, which is what I'm working on now. And now I'm adding highlights, and I've opened up a new layer, and um, the mode of the layer is uh, Add Glow. <clears throat> and using white ink and the airbrush, I'm putting in these highlights. And by making it an add glow layer, you create this kind of really shiny, uh, kind of glowing effect, um, creating the impression that the costume is some kind of futuristic material, you know, spandex or plastic, not that they're futuristic, but you know what I mean? I mean, it just looks cool. And now I'm starting to work on the robot. Um, and that image of the robot's face is a reference image Carl had sent me, and I'm using it to select colors. And because the robot color layer is lower than the spontaneous color layers, I can just freely kind of color away and not worry about going over spontaneous. Okay, looking nice. Several hours later, you know, we're seeing all of the main characters more or less finished um, in terms of color. And what I'm doing now is, oh, I'm demonstrating that you can use the edit tools to change the hue color of anything. If you basically select the color layer, you can then use uh, the hue slider to, to change the color if you change your mind and want it to be something different.
Now I'm using the magic wand tool uh, in the robot ink slayer to select the eyeballs. The magic wand tool is very, very handy for um, making quick selections, isolating things. Continuing on with coloring the uh, details of the robot. And you can see the marching ants around the uh, around the outline of the robot because I've selected the uh, the using the magic wand tool I've selected the robot's flats layer completely. Okay, and there's our final cover. I've added some bells and whistles that glow around Spontania, and as you can see, just to remind you, it's a pyramidal composition, very pleasing and stable. I'm very happy with it. Thanks for watching this, everybody. I sure hope you found it fun and informative. If you did, please subscribe to this channel, Icon Media EDU, and you can follow me, Prentice Rollins, on Instagram here. And be sure to leave any comments or questions in the uh, comments box below. I look forward to hearing from you all. Okay, see you next time.